Welcome to this next episode of our virtual tour of the Holy Land. Today we're standing on the Mount of Olives where we remember Jesus riding into Jerusalem on a donkey right before his death. As people shouted Hosanna and waved palm branches. And we also remember that his final triumphant return will take place on this very Mount of Olives. Before we listen to Hans, please join us on a short virtual tour on the Mount of Olives. Then join our family as we lead you in a short time of worship before we hear Hans's message. Now, please join us as we take you on a quick tour of the Mount of Olives. Welcome, dear friends, to a virtual tour of the Mount of Olives. The Mount of Olives is a place where history, prophecy, and faith come together in a timeless embrace. As we stand here together, we're hit with the realization that we are on holy ground, as this mountain is considered more important than any other mountain in the world to believers. And why is that? According to biblical prophecies, right here, we will welcome the Messiah who will come to reign in an eternal kingdom of peace. So, why are we beginning this tour in a seemingly unlikely place, a graveyard? Right here is the world's largest Jewish cemetery and also some of the most expensive real estate in the world. And why is that? While Christians believe that the place where Jesus will return is the Mount of Olives, many Jews believe that this is the very place where the Messiah will appear for the first time. And they want a front row seat. But this cemetery location is more than a burial place when we consider the importance of the Mount of Olives. As we look out from here, we consider that the Mount of Olives is where, according to the Gospels, Jesus comes from Jericho, followed by a crowd who were worked into a lather as they hoped he was the Messiah who would free them from the oppression of the Romans. But of course, we know that Jesus' mission was far more important than that. So here, from the Mount of Olives, Jesus sees Jerusalem. From around here, you are in the same area where Jesus would have been as he looked onto the holy city. And what an amazing view of this magnificent city and temple it must have been for anyone coming here 2,000 years ago. Although the temple was demolished by the Romans in 70 AD, what we see today is still quite impressive. Today on top of the Temple Mount, you can see the Dome of the Rock where Muslims believe that it's the place where Muhammad ascended to heaven, or so they say. But 2,000 years ago, Jesus saw something very different. There was no Dome of the Rock. Jesus saw the second Jewish temple in full glory, a 50-meter high building all in white, blazing in all of its stunning magnificence. Jesus' view was actually more like this Holy Land model of Jerusalem that's located at the Israel Museum. So where is the Mount of Olives? The Mount of Olives is nestled in the heart of East Jerusalem, just east of the Old City. Although most of the olive trees are now gone, it is believed that its name is derived from the lush olive groves that once graced its slopes. Although we are going to highlight the importance of the Mount of Olives during the Passion Week and Christ's Ascension and Triumphant Return, let's also go back, way back, to its Old Testament significance as well. In the pages of the Old Testament, the Mount of Olives emerges as a sacred sanctuary where the faithful sought solace and divine favor. It was here that King David climbed to the Mount of Olives in a moment of anguish, weeping as he fled from the rebellion of his son Absalom. 
Imagine King David as he stood on this mountain overlooking Jerusalem and in a state of complete loss over a son who wanted to overthrow him and even kill him. 2 Samuel 15.30 says, But David continued up the Mount of Olives, weeping as he went. His head was covered and he was barefoot. All the people with him covered their heads too and were weeping as they went up. The Mount of Olives also bears witness to the darkness of human hearts. For it was here that King Solomon erected altars to the child-sacrificing foreign gods of Moloch and Chemosh, leading the people away from the true God and bringing divine judgment upon the land. Yet despite its dark past, the Mount of Olives also stands as a reminder of God's intervention to rescue us. When God's people were enslaved in Babylon, God gave Ezekiel a vision of hope to share with his chosen people that the day of freedom is coming. The Mount of Olives is exalted as a place where the glory of the Lord stands, a beacon of God's divine presence. Therefore say, This is what the Sovereign Lord says. I will gather you from the nations and bring you back from the countries where you have been scattered, and I will give you back the land of Israel again. Then the cherubim with the wheels beside them spread their wings, and the glory of the God of Israel was above them. The glory of the Lord went up from within the city and stopped above the mountain east of it. In the book of Zechariah, it speaks of the end times, a day when the Lord will stand upon the Mount of Olives and the mountain will split in two, ushering in a new era of divine intervention and redemption. For believers, it is a promise of resurrection and renewal a testament to God's faithfulness to his promises and his people. On that day, his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives, east of Jerusalem, and the Mount of Olives will be split in two from east to west, forming a great valley with half of the mountain moving north and half moving south. Now, let's focus on the importance of the Mount of Olives in the New Testament as well as highlight some of the sites surrounding the area. As we journey through the New Testament, the Mount of Olives comes alive with the echoes of Jesus' teaching and miracles. For it was here amidst the olive trees and the rocky terrain that Jesus taught his disciples on the end times and offered words of comfort in the face of tribulation. And of course, we know the Mount of Olives played a significant role during the Passion Week of Jesus, during which several Old Testament messianic prophecies were fulfilled in this very place. But there's one more prophecy that still awaits fulfillment, and we will get to that. On Palm Sunday, we still celebrate the triumphant entry of Jesus as people wave palm branches From Luke 19 we read, When he came near the place where the road goes down the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of disciples began joyfully to praise God in loud voices for all the miracles they had seen. Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. As we walk down from the top of the Mount of Olives, we are met with several churches that remind us of the Passion Week of Jesus. The first church we'll talk about is the one with the golden domes. This is a church of Mary Magdalene, a well-known Russian Orthodox church. This church is dedicated to Mary Magdalene, who is mentioned several times in the New Testament but particularly for her presence at Jesus' crucifixion and especially when she discovered Jesus' empty tomb. The next church we visit will be the church of Dominus Flavit. Dominus Flavit translates the Lord wept in Latin. The church was designed and constructed between 1953 and 1955. 
It was fashioned in the shape of a teardrop to symbolize the tears of Christ. For here we remember the gospel account of Jesus as he wept in great agony for what was about to befall Jerusalem. From Luke chapter 19. As he approached Jerusalem and saw the city, he wept over it and said, If you, even you, had only known on this day what would bring you peace, but now it is hidden from your eyes. The days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment against you and encircle you and hem you in on every side. They will dash you to the ground, you and the children within your walls. They will not leave one stone on another because you did not recognize the time of God's coming to you. Continuing down this path, we come to the Garden of Gethsemane and the Church of All Nations, also known as the Basilica of the Agony, which recounts the extreme agony Jesus went through as he contemplated his crucifixion and where he was betrayed by Judas on the same Mount of Olives where his disciples had hailed Jesus as the Messiah just days earlier. But we'll cover more on the Garden of Gethsemane and the Church of All Nations in a future episode. The Mount of Olives reminds us of the great extremes of loss and of hope, of death and of new life. It is a place of great contrast, just like our own lives. So let's return to a panoramic view from the Mount of Olives, gazing upon the old city of Jerusalem. From here, we remember Jesus' ascension and final triumphant return. From right here on the Mount of Olives, Acts chapter 1 recounts that Jesus ascended to heaven in the presence of his disciples and then angels were sent to comfort them. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven, as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, who also said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will so come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. So we also remember that the Mount of Olives will be the place of Jesus' return in his second coming as foretold in the book of Acts. This same mountain that witnessed his ascension to heaven now holds the promise of his glorious return. I pray that this virtual tour has deepened your understanding of the profound spiritual importance of the Mount of Olives. Would you please help us to spread the message of hope and faith in these episodes by liking, subscribing, and sharing this series? We would so appreciate that. Until our next episode of the Breakforth Virtual Holy Land Tour, may your hearts be touched and your spirits uplifted. Shalom, and until our next adventure.
strength to face a day And in your presence all our fears are washed away Washed away Hosanna The God who saves us, worthy of all our praises, Hosanna, Hosanna, come have your way among us, we welcome you here, Lord Jesus. This is a decent spot to spend the morning. <laughs> so, we are at Harazitim, in Hebrew, the Mount of Olives. And of course, what is unique with this mountain is what it is overlooking. This is the best viewpoint by far, and has been throughout all of biblical history, looking on the Temple Mount and old Jerusalem, Jerusalem in Jesus' day and age. And it's intriguing if you look there to the southeastern corner of the Temple Mount. You see that? Yeah. You can see it like small stones to begin with. Ridiculous. But then if you look a little bit further down, you see the bigger building blocks. Yeah. You see the bigger stones? Yeah. yeah. All those comes from, from, from King Herod. They are 2,000 years old. So you're looking at the same stones that Jesus saw many, many times. There we can say for sure you are having the same view as Jesus had 2,000 years ago. As soon as you just look a couple of meters down there. Kind of gives you perspective, right? And um, the Temple Mount, Mount Moriah which we will be speaking more about, of course, throughout the tour, that uh, word, that expression, Moriah, comes from the Hebrew word Ra, that means to see. So, this is the center on earth, according to the Bible. The Temple Mount, Jerusalem, the apple of, of God's eye. Moriah, to see. This is the mountain where God reveals Himself, where we see Him. The mountain where uh, Abraham did not have to sacrifice his son Isaac. That, by the way, according to the rabbis, Isaac was 37 years old. So, he was willing to sacrifice himself. Abraham would have no chance to, to, to make him do it. But instead, an animal sacrifice was given. And it was like a prophetic picture. Abraham did not have to sacrifice the promised son. While as our Father in heaven, you're looking at the city where he sacrificed his only begotten son. And so, the Mount of Olives connected to the temple Many scholars believe, and you can see it on paintings in the Temple Institute, that there actually, throughout some times in Old Testament history, there was a bridge built between the Temple Mount and the Mount of Olives. I told you about the connection between the Temple Mount and the, the sacrifices that went on there, and the connection, for example, to the Red Heifer, and the ashes of the Red Heifer connected to the Temple Mount and the Mount of Olives. This is the mountain that the Bible describes King David. He went over this mountain and he cried, right? Because his son, you say Absalom? Yeah. yeah. Had instigated an uproar against his own father. So David went over this mountain and he cried. And this mountain is really a divider, geographically. South, perhaps 15 kilometers, we have Bethlehem alongside the mountain ridge, so to speak. 
West, we have the Temple Mount, and down we have the Kidron Valley. Uh, that the Kidron Valley goes all the way down to the Dead Sea. So we will show you the Kidron Valley, the other end, so to speak, down by the Dead Sea as we go to Masada. Ways away. Down here we have Gethsemane. And if you move up to the top, just a couple of meters from here, a stone throw like this, you come up to the top of the Mount of Olives, and what do you see? Well, you keep on seeing the Temple Mount, of course, to the west, but to the east, what do you see? Buses. 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 <laughs> well, yeah, but the buses are here. <laughs> not, not, not if you get up on the top. <laughs> or maybe also buses. <laughs> there are buses everywhere, right? <laughs> no, what you see is the desert. Immediately starting at the top here, the desert. And, and you see how it goes down slope all the way down to the Dead Sea. You can see the Dead Sea from certain angles in Jerusalem, all the way down to the Dead Sea, the lowest point on earth. So this is really the divider. Now, very important in the New Testament. Jesus sits on the Mount of Olives when he delivers the sermon about the end times, Matthew 24 and 25. We will cover that one evening. We have the last part of Jesus' life before he died on the cross and was resurrected from the dead. The Gospels tell us how Jesus started that last journey towards Jerusalem. Luke 9.51, a very special Greek expression, uh, um, tells us that, that Jesus encountered enormous pressure as he started on that last journey going up towards Jerusalem because he knew that he was going to be the sacrificial offering for all of mankind's sins. What a burden. We cannot even imagine that burden. And then, perhaps a couple of weeks or so before Pesach, Passover, Jesus visits a village, one stone's throw that way, Bethany, right? That means in Hebrew, the house of the poor. We have a theme here, don't we? Blessed are those who are poor in spirit. Here we have the house of the poor. And Jesus' dear friend, Lazarus, Lazarus has been dead for four days. Lazarus in Hebrew means God helps. And Jesus, one stone's throw from here, speaks to a man who has been dead for four days. He's already smelling, his sister says. And please note that this is only a short time before Pesach, before Passover, a pilgrim feast. And during Pesach, the population in the city would increase incredibly, perhaps from 50,000 to over 1 million. So people were already, you know, coming towards Jerusalem and to Jerusalem from the south, from the west, from the east, and from the north. And now in Bethany, Jesus tells Lazarus, a man who's been dead for four days and four nights, he tells him to come forth, and he does. People were not used to that. <laughs> It kind of shocked them. So, you know, most of the Jewish people followed Jesus according to the Gospel of John, but the, some of the leaders did not like him much at all. They, they saw him as a threat. And now they are saying that the whole world is following this man. They're almost in panic. The Jesus fever temperature, the Jesus temperature is at a fever pitch. And Jesus leaves the city for a short time, goes out to a small place in the village, in the, in the desert called Ephraim, and then he comes back, perhaps the day before Palm Sunday. And what does he do? Very deliberately, he's following his father's plan, and he comes back to Bethany. And you can imagine, he's sitting there 
Perhaps Saturday evening, as it seems in, in, in the, the Gospel of John, he's sitting there and he's eating together with the man who he had raised from the dead, who had been dead for four days and four nights. And only like a week or two weeks later, he's sitting there having a meal with that guy. I can promise you they were not alone. Because Sabbath had just ended, so people were allowed to walk from here to Bethany. So, you know, people, I think, came there in the thousands already Saturday evening just to get a glimpse at, at he's sitting there and he's eating with Lazarus. That is when Mary anoints Jesus with prophetic oil. You know what that, where that flower came from? Extremely expensive. That flower comes from Himalaya. It only grows on the high, highest mountain range of the world. So it's a prophetic sign. Jesus is going from the heights, from heavens, down to death. As far down as anyone can go. And then comes Sunday morning, the first day of the week. And John seems to be implying in his gospel that it is the 10th of Nisan. And that was the day in the Jewish year when the father was supposed to select the paschal lamb, the lamb for the household that would be sacrificed right before Passover. Well, according to John and all the other gospels, that was the day when our father in heaven showed the Jewish people and all of mankind who is his sacrificial lamb, his own beloved son. So, early, early Sunday morning, Jesus leaves Bethany. He's very close to right here, and he asks two of his disciples to go and get a donkey. He loves for them to be two by two, by the way. He doesn't even let them go to get a donkey themselves. <laughs> two people. And now something happens, and I will read about that in Matthew 21. And you know this text by heart, many of you, but let's try to look at it with new eyes. The disciples went and did as Jesus had instructed them, Matthew 21, 6, verse 7. They brought the donkey, picture this mountain now, and the colt and placed their cloaks on them for Jesus to sit on. Now already here we get a kind of a little hint that the Holy Spirit is at work. Because, you know, the apostles, I love that the Bible is so honest, right? So it has been telling us, the Bible has been, so to speak, eavesdropping on the apostles. What were they discussing? as Jesus was going up to Jerusalem carrying mankind's sin to be the sac sacrifice for, for all of our sins. Now, what did the apostles do at the same time? What did they discuss? Who has most likes? <laughs> right? Who has the most popular Facebook site? Right? That was their discussion. They're very much like Swedes. <laughs> Right? But now something happens that shows you that the Holy Spirit, already here we see that He is at work because what do they do? They placed their cloaks on the donkeys for Jesus to sit on. Their cloaks. The cloak was like the thing that, that in, in, in that day and age, that was your Facebook page. That was what showed your identity. What, for many people, that was the most valuable thing you had, your cloak. Now they took their cloaks, they took themselves, we might say, and they just put themselves for Jesus to sit on. And this is most interesting because soon thousands are going to do the same. Thousands are going to follow their example, to forget about themselves 
and to focus on glorifying Jesus. We all have a choice. Are we going to use our cloak to focus on ourselves, make people, you know, elevate us, or to glorify Jesus? They choose the latter at this specific point in time, and that leads to thousands and thousands and thousands doing the same thing and we get to read about it as a prophetical sign 2,000 years later. Now isn't that something? And now something, this, this development with the Holy Spirit just uh, keeps on building. So, they ride over the top of the Mount of Olives, and you might recall what they had been doing Saturday evening, the evening before, how thousands had crowded around uh, uh, Bethany and Jesus' meal together with Lazarus. So, you know, people were, they were like ready to start. The Jesus temperature was at a fever pitch, as I already said. So can you imagine now, people on the Temple Mount, early Sunday morning, right before Passover, 10th of Nisan, they, they see Jesus here. And now Jesus does something he has not allowed for throughout all of his ministry, all of his life, really. He allows for people to publicly worship him as the Messiah. And can you imagine the shock for the apostles? Now, Jesus has always held this back. Silent. Don't say, no, no. And now, at this place, here, you know, at the very scene of the whole Temple Mount, right? At Passover, a million people here, all of a sudden, heaven opens, and Jesus allows for people to worship Him as the Messiah is. So can you picture the scene of Jesus riding over the, the ridge here, and thousands and thousands and thousands and they ran i bet they ran you know they ran down and they ran. they ran up i can see people at the temple mount you know i can see how they move about i can even see the color that they have that guy is having white that guy i think is having red so, so you know they saw what happened here so people ran up here and heaven just opened and they did the same things that the apostles had started to do. They took off their cloaks. They took off their likes. And they put it before the donkey's feet. And they started to worship Jesus. And you know, many, many, many of those who did this, they had been longing for three and a half years to express publicly their love for Jesus. This was their first moment to do it. And you know, at what spot? To be able to do it here. We love you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. We worship you, Jesus. You have transformed our lives. You have healed us. You have given us hope back. We believe you are the Messiah. We believe you are the Son of God. And heaven has not opened. Can you imagine that scene? And, and John also tells us that they did not only put cloaks. They also had what? And we think that's, of course, they had that. It's Palm Sunday. <laughs> of course they're not stupid I mean, right? but you know for them that was like taking out a Christmas tree in the middle of the summer because palm branches for them that by the way most often grew down in the Jordan Valley at the lowest point on earth palm branches for them that was Sukkot that was the the feast in the fall, the last feast that for them was the joyous feast, the heavenly feast, the, mes the Messiah arrival feast. Now they took palm branches, even though it was Pesach, most untimely, because they just, you know, got the signal from the Holy Spirit, this is the Messiah and he is arriving right now, worship him. And, you know, the Jewish people were shocked all around when they saw the palm branches. They're celebrating Sukkot up there, even though it's Pesach. They have to believe that Messiah is coming right now. Is this the Messiah? And then what they cried out, also led by the Holy Spirit, they cried out, Hosanna! That is from Psalms 118, a messianic psalm, by the way. And what does it mean? 
Blessed is he, it could be, and that's it. Baruch haba b'shem Adonai. So that, that is right, because that's in Matthew 23, 39. That's a prophetic sign we're going to speak about at an, uh, at an evening at the hotel. So that's really connected to Jesus the last week. But what does Hosanna mean? Praise the Lord is also good. Hallelujah is praise the Lord. And you know that expression. But Hosanna is the same as in the word Jesus. You know, save us. But in, in an even more intensive verbal form in the Hebrew language that reads, you save us. The most intense prayer for salvation that you ever can pray is Hosanna. So led by the Holy Spirit, they started to shout to him. They, 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 they went, you know, the son of David, Hosanna, Hosanna. And people started to, to cry out, Hosanna, save us, save us, save us, save us. And Jesus, he sat on a donkey and fulfilled Zechariah 9, 9, that the king would come. He would be righteous. He would be glorious, but he would be coming on a donkey. That's a very strange animal for a king to arrive in. I've been riding donkey once. It doesn't work well for me. <laughs> I have two tall legs. I know, I'm, I'm not kidding. My legs hit the stones all the time. I have to put up my legs. So, you know, when you ride a donkey, you look up on everyone. That was the perfect animal that the Holy Spirit gave Zechariah in that majestic prophecy to describe the first arrival of the Messiah. The first time he, don't, he did not come to rule from above, first and foremost. The first time he came to wash feet. He came to, to forgive us. He came to us, so to speak, from beneath. And he was going very soon to wash the apostles' feet. And he was going to die on the cross. So when they worshipped Jesus, when they shouted their hosannas, they had to worship him downwards. He was below them. So people there at the temple mount was looking, who's there in the middle? Who, who are they like stooping down to? Oh, that's Jesus there. And then all of a sudden, Jesus stopped. Halfway down, perhaps. And when he stopped, Luke tells us he started to cry. Because he knew he was going to die on the cross. And then we move to 40 days after Jesus' death and resurrection. And 40 days... 40 days afterwards, he takes with him the apostles. And we have it in Luke 24, verse 50. Then he led them out to the vicinity of Bethany. And it's, it's most surely on this side of Bethany, which means the top of the Mount of Olives. He led them out to the vicinity of Bethany. He was standing here. Can you just picture him doing that? Together with his apostles. And then he says, And lifting up his hands, he blessed them. You know, you can go down to the Temple Mount at Sukkot. It has just happened a couple of weeks ago or a week ago. Uh, and I've been there at Sukkot. And you can see the priests, descendants of, of Aaron. And they bless the people. And it's beautiful. And they take their prayer shawls, their talits, and they cover their faces and they take up their hands like this. So you should think about God and not about them. Beautiful. Now Jesus, he raises his hands like a high priest. And he blesses them. But we hear nothing about him covering his face. He did not have to cover his face because he is God. So they were looking at the face of 100% human, 100% God. And right where we are, or a stone's throw from here, any direction, perhaps at the top of the Mount of Olives, what do we know? But exactly somewhere around here, Jesus stood with his apostles and he started to bless them. And as he was blessing them, what could they see? His face. His loving eyes, that great joy and holiness. They could also see the hands and they could see what? The holes. Here or here. They could see the holes. They saw his face. They saw the wounds. They saw his love, his holiness, 
He looked at them with such great fatherly love. And then as he was blessing them, the glory clouds came, the kavod, the glory of the Lord, shining brighter than the sun. And all of a sudden he was gone, taken to his father's right hand in heaven. And two angels stood there all of a sudden and they were saying a pretty obvious question, obvious answer I would say. Why are you looking up into heaven? Pretty obvious answer to that one. But then they went on to say, this Jesus whom you have seen been taken to heaven, he will come back in the same way as you saw him been taken up. The same way. And then we have a majestic prophecy in Zechariah chapter 14. When Zechariah gets a vision from the Lord that speaks about Jesus' return to this earth. And you know, one reason that we have so many graves, and you see the graves? Is that also those Jews who do not believe in Jesus, they believe that Zechariah 14 speaks about the coming Messiah, coming to the Mount of Olives. And that's why you have all these graves here. They are, they are in front seat. <laughs> right? And we read Zechariah 14.4. On that day, his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives, which faces Jerusalem to the east. The Mount of Olives will be split in half from east to west, forming a huge valley so that half the mountain will move to the north and half to the south. And then I read on in the end of verse 5 and listen to this. You are at the very spot, my friends, listen. Then the Lord, my God, will come and all the holy ones with him. And it spoke just in verse four about his feet. So God has feet. That is Jesus who will come back to this very spot at the end of the tribulation and they will so be so much turmoil and the mountain will split the whole earth will shake and in tremor as the majestic messiah comes back this time not on a donkey this time not from beneath but as the glorious forever ruling king coming back on the white horse to rule mankind forever amen Thank you for joining us on the Mount of Olives. Hans shared about Christ's entry into Jerusalem as people cried Hosanna and also his triumphal final return when he will stand on the Mount of Olives. We pray that you are blessed as you consider Christ returning for you when he will set things right. No matter what you are going through right now, whether you are on a mountaintop or in a valley, May you fix your eyes on the eternal hope that waits for you. Let's take a quiet moment now to reflect on this and speak to God about what he is laying on our hearts. If you have not already done so, please go to breakforth.org to download the accompanying Bible study for this video. And if you would like to support this series to enable us to share this for free around the world, please prayerfully consider a gift by visiting breakforth.org. Until next time. May God richly bless you and may he break forth in wonderful ways of love, peace and purpose in your life and in the lives of others. Mm -hmm.